Okay, so welcome to Invertebrates 2. Um, so this is, again, chapter 33, but this is only about uh, eight pages in chapter 33. And so we'll go through chapter 33 section by section. Uh, we'll probably use about four different lectures to cover the whole thing. So when you look at the phylogeny um, of uh, all of our animals, you see that the invertebrates uh, encompass pretty much everything on this phylogeny except for the chordates, which are the only vertebrates. And so we'll talk about them last in the semester, but right now we're going through the red. And so in lecture one, um, which was uh, mostly on uh, Thursday, we talked about periphera, tenophora, cnidaria, acela, and uh, platyhelminthes. Um, now, <clears throat> today we'll talk about some of the other groups in Lophotrochozoa, um, rotifers, mollusca, annelids. So, remember, um, we're talking about the Lophotrochozoans. And so the Lophotrochozoans include the flatworms, which are the uh, platyhelminthes, um, annelids, which are the segmented worms, mollusks, uh, clams, and oysters and things like that, including the cephalopods and rotifers. So let's talk about the rotifers. Uh, some of you saw these in uh, lab when we were looking at diatoms and things with the protists. They are not protists, but uh, as I told you at the time, they have a wheel of cilia around the mouth that spins and the water moves into their mouth. And so uh, these are actually animals. So um, the rotifers are microscopic, they're tiny, um, and they're all aquatic, uh, they're bilateral, so they have a pseudocele, so along with the uh, nematodes, which also have a uh, pseudocele. And there it is, you can see in the movie there, uh, the wheel of cilia around the mouth moving, and they're uh, moving all the water that they can get into their digestive cavity. And then when they get scared, they retract back like that, as you can see. And so that's what the rotifer refers to, those two wheels you see in the mouth there. And they are cilia. <coughs> and so, um, oops, okay. So um, in rotifer structure, um, we talked about plankton a good bit when we talked about phytoplankton, uh, when we talked about uh, protists, but there's also another part of plankton, and that is called zooplankton. Uh, zooplankton are not photoautotrophic, uh, like the phytoplankton are, but zooplankton are in the same place, so often on the surfaces of uh, ocean uh, waters and uh, fresh water and uh, streams and rivers and things, and so zooplankton are the heterotrophic portion of that plankton, and they often eat uh, phytoplankton, and they eat um, uh, other small particulate matter in the ocean. And so there's a definition, heterotrophic organisms live in oceans, etc. Um, and so they do have a complete digestive system, so they have two openings, so they have a mouth and an anus, and they have an open circulatory system. So remember, the open circulatory system is the one where all the organs sit in the giant cavity, called a hemocele, and uh, in that cavity, you have your hemolymph, which is kind of like your blood, and uh, the hemolymph is pumped over all the organs in that cavity by hearts. Um, they do have a brain, it's very tiny, but they have a brain with nerves, and they have up to five eyes around uh, the head region, and so uh, it's fairly primitive, but they do have a lot of the primitive animal characteristics. <clears throat> when it comes to rotifer reproduction, things get a bit weird. Um, in rotifers, males are optional. And so uh, most of the males are tiny, uh, and they don't live very long, uh, and uh, oftentimes you have populations that are completely 100% female. Males usually, when uh, they're around, they don't live very long, so because they don't live very long, they don't need to eat. So uh, uh, mayflies, uh, which are insects, uh, also have this uh, lifestyle where the males uh, don't eat, uh, and they only live for a very short period of time. Um, and in rotifers, they also go through something uh, called traumatic insemination, which doesn't sound very fun. And if you think it doesn't sound very fun, you're right. Uh, traumatic insemination is where the male, uh, to inseminate the female, uh, pierces the body wall of the female with his reproductive organ and then uh, inseminates her cavity, her coelom, 
with his sperm. And so there is no opening in the female, so he makes an opening. And so uh, oftentimes the female can die from this. And this, this is also, uh, incidentally, the same way that bed bugs reproduce. Uh, bed bugs, of course, are not rotifers. But um, they uh, also reproduce the same way. Traumatic, it's called traumatic insemination. And so um, there's no surprise, then oftentimes females uh, reproduce asexually instead. And so females cl can clone themselves and basically have populations of 100% female and where males aren't needed. And so uh, you can see this little diagram on the right here, low density populations, uh, rotifers are asexual, and so the females clone themselves. And uh, they're just fine, but uh, oftentimes when um, uh, populations get high, um, you have uh, hormones being released and uh, sexual reproduction occurs and you have actually have uh, genetic recombination occurring. So our next phylum here is the mollusks. So we're going to spend a lot of time in the mollusks and that is because uh, in the mollusks we're going to finally see a lot of the larger more complex organs um, that we get in the more complex animals uh, including the chordates. We're going to get things like lungs and we're going to get um, other organs like gills and uh, kidneys and things like this that we'll see in the chordate. So we're going to spend a good amount of time in the mollusks talking about some of these organs and um, how they work. Um, so some characteristics of our mollusks, they are the second most successful phylum of animals. Uh, this is of course second to the arthropods. Um, symmetry is of course bilateral. Uh, these are a member of bilateria. Uh, coelom, they have an enterocele, so they have a, a true coelom. Um, segmented, are they segmented? No, they are not. So mollusks are not segmented organisms. Um, their digestive system is also going to be complete, so they have an opening. Uh, for the mouth and an opening for the exit on uh, the anus and they do they are triploblastic like most of the other animals are talking about so they have three germ layers um, when it comes to the body plan of the mollusks uh, as I was saying earlier this is the first time we see a lot of major organ types and so we have three body parts within the mollusk uh, we have the foot which is oftentimes the place that is used uh, for movement in cephalopods this is uh, turned into the tentacles and the arms but in things like slugs and snails and things, it's just a slippery little, um, well, foot <laughs> that touches the bottom of uh, the substrate and helps it move. Um, there is also the visceral mass, which is basically a uh, large um, structure that contains all the internal organs. Um, and uh, the visceral mass is going to be held within something called the mantle. So the mantle is sort of the cavity um, that the visceral mass is held within. And so you can see that diagram in the upper right. You have your shell, and then just beneath your shell is your mantle, and your mantle is going to hold uh, your visceral mass. You see the heart and the gills and the digestive glands, stomachs, etc. All that is included in the visceral mass. And so it's pretty simple, three parts, um, but you have other organs and things within that. And so your mantle uh, being a cavity and it's also going to hold the visceral mass, in addition it's going to produce to its, to its exterior the shell, maybe. I say maybe because some mollusks don't have a shell, right? Think of an octopus, think of a slug. Um, in those organisms, um, the shell is actually going to be <clears throat> vestigial. And so the mantle is going to surround your organs, the visceral mass, and it's going to help circulation. So let's talk about the, the shell and mollusks. So the shell and mollusks is largely made of calcium carbonate, um, AKA limestone. And so it um, fossilizes very well. This is why oftentimes you see fossils of clam shells and oyster shells and uh, all other kinds of mollusks. Um, you can even see this in concrete uh, because uh, these shells do not degrade very easily or very quickly. And so they're going to be there for a very, very, very long time. And so we have a very good um, uh, historical record um, of mollusks because of this shell. And so as we said, I already said that, secreted by the mantle. And so what is the purpose of the shell? Obviously the purpose of the shell is uh, twofold. So number one, the shell is going to help uh, protect the organism. Um, and number two, it's going to help support the body. Uh, it's going to help the body uh, connect to something and give it some structure. 
because um, they are very squishy. Uh, most of the body of the mollusk is uh, squishy, soft, and so they need something to connect to to give them some type of form, and uh, the shell helps with that. And so as we said, the shell is not going to be present in all taxa. Uh, it's vestigial in most of the cephalopods, uh, the octopus, the squid is vestigial, um, and uh, some gastropods as well, so the, in other words, the slug. But there is some cephalopods that um, have a shell, like you see in the background here. That is a cephalopod mollusk that is called a nautilus, uh, a living fossil, really. We have fossils of nautilus um, going back hundreds of million years that look almost exactly like this nautilus. And so... Um, Mollusks are largely going to be aquatic. Um, we're familiar with mollusks because we see snails and slugs on the land, but most mollusks are going to be in the water. And so most of them are going to therefore have gills, and they're also going to therefore have some type of structure that flows water over um, and inside their body. Um, these are called siphons. And sometimes uh, a siphon is going to be, uh, or the organ is going to only have one siphon. Um, and uh, like we'll see in the squid, uh, sometimes they have incurrent and excurrent siphons. And so basically water going in, water going out. And siphons are going to do several things. So when the water comes in, the water, as I said, is going to go across the gills. And then when the water moves across the gills, um, the oxygen is removed as it uh, flows against the blood vessels. And then the CO2 is put into the water and then it flows out. And so you take in oxygen, and you're pushing out carbon dioxide. Um, these siphons are also going to help the uh, mollusks feed. So if there's any food detected uh, in the water column, any particulate matter or anything that can be eaten, um, that is that, that water is moved to the mouth and uh, it's digested. And lastly, the siphon is going to help to move because it can use, use this uh, water inside of its body. Once it takes in the water through the siphon, it can push it out very quickly, and then the entire organism moves uh, through that propulsion. Uh, mostly cephalopods are the ones who are doing this. And this is how they move very, very quickly uh, through the use of the siphon. And um, <clears throat> depending on when you've listened to this, either we have done or we will do the dissection on uh, Tuesday and we'll uh, look at uh, squid siphons. So when it comes to feeding, um, the uh, mollusks often feed uh, via something called a radula. And you see a little video, a cute little snail is going to uh, use its radula to uh, basically scrape against the surface. And when it scrapes against the surface, it's scraping off algae or protists or bacteria or anything on that surface, and then it's going to move it to the stomach. And the radula is basically a long toothed ribbon with chitinous little teeth on it. And you can see on the right side here, that looks like a tongue, and the tongue has little teeth. So that's what you can think of a tongue with teeth. And if you recall, we talked about chitin when we talked about fungi and fungi cell walls. Chitin is made up of, uh, basically it's a complex polysaccharide, and it's going to be the main component within fungi cell walls. But it's also going to be in a lot of animals too including mollusks, little teeth on the radula. We'll talk about it again when we talk about insects and arthropods. So, how do mollusks breathe? Well, it depends. Are you a land mollusk or are you a aquatic mollusk? If you are a land mollusk, you are going to breathe with lungs. This is the first time we've encountered lungs. So what are lungs? Basically, they're sacs. Sacs filled with sacs because you have alveoli within your lungs, which are small little sacs, and then your entire lung is a sac itself. So it allows for the diffusion of gases because you have um, uh, veins and arteries that pass very, very, very close to these sacs. And then as the air comes in, the oxygen diffuses into the uh, blood vessels, and then the CO2 diffuses out, sort of like the gills that we talked about. Oh, there you go. Gills. Aquatic mollusks have gills. And so the same concept. Basically, you have these uh, layers of tissue, and the water is going to flow in very, very, very close to these uh, veins and arteries. Uh, and then uh, once it contacts them, uh, it's going to uh, input the oxygen or flow out over the CO2. Now, I say veins and arteries, and that is uh, indicative of a closed uh, circulatory system, which the cephalop cephalopods have, but the uh, most mollusks do not. They have an open circulatory system. But the same um, 
the function is occurring, the uh, lungs or the gills are very close to our big cavity, <coughs> our hemoseal. And so therefore, uh, when the oxygen comes in, uh, it goes into the hemoseal. Remember, that is the big vat where all the uh, organs are sitting. And um, uh, oxygen comes in, CO2 flows out. So um, when it comes to circulation, as we said, it's uh, open and, and closed. And so most have an open. Um, this is the clams and the oysters and the, and the mussels. And the, uh, most of the mollusks have an open circulatory system. Um, and as we said, that cavity that we said mollusks have an enteroseal, um, that acts as a hemoseal. And so um, remember that hemoseal is the big tub of blood or hemolymph. And um, that is where all the organs are sitting in that hemoseal. Okay, and remember that is getting pumped by hearts. There's the heart, single three chambered heart uh, that is going to pump that blood. I say hearts plural because squids have multiple hearts, but some, or, some mollusks only have one. And so, um, interestingly, in the mollusks, uh, the blood is going to use a uh, not a hemoglobin, but something called hemocyanin. And so, uh, this is going to transport oxygen. This gives their blood uh, a bluish color instead of a red color. And so, I should also mention here that uh, the cephalopods have a closed circulatory system rather than an open circulatory system. So they have hearts uh, as well, and they also have uh, veins and arteries, um, and they do not have a hemoseal. Okay, so another uh, organ system of the mollusks that we need to discuss is their nervous system. Um, they have two to three ventral nerve cords, and this is going to be a constant theme without animals, so I really want you to remember this. In animals, the nerve cord, basically the uh, for in humans and other uh, vertebrates, the nerve cord is protected by our spine, right? That's why we have a spine in the first place, is to protect our nerve cord. Well, in us, our nerve cord is dorsal, right? It's along your back. But in invertebrates, <clears throat> usually the nerve cord is ventral. It's along the belly region. And so the same thing for mollusks. They have a ventral nerve cord, and... Uh, most mollusks don't have a centralized brain. They have multiple brain ganglia. So in other words, as you see in this little picture, the little black circles are the brain, right? And so they have a, a tiny little brain section in the foot called a ganglion. A ganglion is sort of like a, just a cluster of nerve cells, like a mini brain. And so they have a, a foot brain. They have a brain near one of the muscles on the right side, and they have a, a uh, another brain near the other adductor muscle on the other side, and so they have multiple tiny little mini brains or, or ganglion in multiple parts of the body. Most are pretty dumb. Most clams and, and oysters and uh, other mollusks are pretty dumb, but of course when it comes down to cephalopods, everything changes. So, um, very quickly, osmoregulation, basically regulating the amount of water and salt um, and, uh, in the body, and also regulating uh, waste excretion, uh, comes down to uh, the kidneys. And kidneys are uh, groups of nephridia. And nephridia is basically a complex word for a bunch of tubes. Uh, nephridia, metanephridia, this is basically the same thing. And uh, nephridia are the precursor to kidneys because kidneys are really just groups of many, many, many nephridia. And same thing for humans. They're just a lot, a lot, a lot of tubes clustered into one organ. And so uh, the function of the kidneys is largely to filter uh, the coelomic fluid, either the hemoseal or the fluid in the uh, veins and arteries and cephalopods, and to... Um, uh, make sure that is relatively clean. So, reproduction and development. Look how cute. Uh, and mollusks, uh, most are going to be dioecious. And uh, this is a term, I don't know if we've had this before, but dioecious, di, of course, meaning two. Dioecious means having two different sexes, having a male and having a female. Some mollusks are not dioecious and instead are hermaphroditic, but most are dioecious. And so remember that mollusks are part of the Lophotrochozoans. And so most of them are going to have, as a member of the Lophotrochozoans, a larvae that is a trochophore. And you can see that in the bottom right. That is a mollusk larva. 
See those hairs coming off of that? That is the band of cilia that defines a trochophore larva. And so this is why they are placed in the Lophotrochozoans. And when it comes to fertilization, some have external. And so basically they, um, uh, the sperm is going to be uh, uh, basically placed outside of the body and is going to be taken in by the female. But some have internal fertilization where the sperm is placed inside of the body of the female. So let's look a little bit at the classification in mollusks. There are four classes, um, the first of which uh, that we'll talk about are the bivalves. And in the bivalves, uh, as the name suggests, bi meaning two, <clears throat> they have two shells. And technically, this, these shells open left to right. Um, they do not have a head, so there's no cephalization occurring. And usually these shells are open. Um, if they're left open, um, the organism is currently feeding. And so it feeds when they're open. When the shells are closed, it is not feeding. It is hiding. It is being basically, uh, it is hiding from predators. And there are basically two types of movements in bivalves. Either uh, they have the foot, and uh, the foot looks like a little tongue that comes out of the shell, and it helps them bury into the sand, for, again, for defense, um, or uh, it helps them attach to rocks or, or other uh, substrates. And then they can also move via their siphon, uh, basically uh, push water out, and then they get to move a little bit. It's nothing like the cephalopods where they get um, practically jet propulsion from their siphon. Um, it's just a little bit of a puff of water and they sort of hop along the, the seabed. Um, and of course the siphon can help do those other things that a siphon does, um, move food over the mouth and help them feed. When it comes to a bivalve, um, here's your body plan. They lack a lot of things that we commonly see in other animals. For example, they have no head, so there's no cephalization going on. They also don't have a radula. Um, if you recall, that radula is the, the chitinous ribbon-like tongue that many mollusks use to scrape against surfaces and eat algae and bacteria. They don't do that. They're basically almost all filter feeders. As I said, they're pretty dumb. Uh, there's really almost no intellect because they their brain is split into multiple ganglia that do different things in the body, like control different muscles in the foot and different organs. And so they're not exactly um, made for uh, doing things like um, you know thinking. And so in, in the top right here, you can see uh, our little foot that's going to come out, and it's going to help them move and dig into the sand. And so when we think of bivalves, we think of things like clams and mussels and oysters and scallops, many of these things that um, we eat, <clears throat> these are all going to be bivalves. <clears throat> so our next class are the cephalopods. The cephalopods are amazing creatures. They are the fastest of all invertebrates, not just the mollusks, all of the invertebrates we will ever talk about that ever exist in the world, they are the fastest. They are the largest. The giant squid is the largest invertebrate in the world. And they are the most intelligent. The octopus is the most intelligent invertebrate in the world. So this is really an amazing group of organisms. There are four unique traits <clears throat> um, within the cephalopods that other mollusks don't have. For example, jet propulsion via their siphon, so they can move very, very fast. Um, with their siphon. They can push out water and they can store water up and then push it out very quickly, allowing them to move very fast through the water to get away from predators or to chase down prey. They have extremely complex eyes. So we talked about this a little bit in the evolution section um, a couple months ago when we talked about the camera eye. And so they have very, very good eyes. In fact, their eyes are in many ways better than our eyes. Um, their eyes have evolved uh, convergently with our eyes, so in other words, they're not related to us, but they also evolve this very complex eye. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they have a closed circulatory system, as we said, so they have uh, veins and arteries uh, and a heart that pumps those, uh, pumps the blood through those veins and arteries. And they have extremely complex behavior um, that uh, we'll talk about a little bit. So uh, they don't really have a foot per se. Uh, their foot has been uh, evolved into tentacles and arms. And so um, their foot is going to be um, attached to the head. So the tentacles are attached to the head. This is why they're called cephalopod. So ceph, meaning head, 
pod or pod meaning foot. So head foot. So basically their feet are attached to the head. Um, and <clears throat> they largely are going to surround the mouth since the mouth is attached to the head. And the mouth is going to also hold within it a hard beak. And that beak is going to help them crunch up food that they bring to their mouth with their tentacles. Um, our cephalopods are pretty amazing. And so in this video here, um, you can watch this on your own. So some other things about cephalopods here, you can see this in uh, the bottom right. This is a cuttlefish basically eating highly advanced predators. Um, they possess the most developed central nervous system of all invertebrates. So they have a very large head and uh, they have a very large brain. Um, they have some uh, abilities to solve problems. So we talked about complex behavior. Um, it has been found out that cephalopods can count. And so they've been tested in the lab with cephalopods, cuttlefish, octopus, uh, squid. It, look in the bottom in this movie and you can see the octopus using tools. And so for example, here it's using a clamshell to close up and hide within. Uh, no other mollusks does this. Really no other invertebrates do this. This is largely a vertebrate type behavior because vertebrates have uh, complex and developed brains. And so our invertebrate has a complex developed brain and so it does some of the same things. Um, they can communicate with each other by changing colors. Many, mollusks, uh, many cephalopods can do this by um, changing um, chromatophores in their skin. And what happens is their skin can uh, fluctuate between different colors and they can even some of the cuttlefish can split their entire body in half by color and um, one side of their body for example can face a female that they want to court and then uh, that color is going to be very uh, inviting and then the other half of their body is facing the other males that they're trying to sh uh, shoo away and then that color of their body is very menacing like a deep dark red um, and so they could and they swim beside the female showing them the nice happy color and then uh, again showing the aggressive color away from the female so really complex behavior in these uh, cephalopods now we talked about the nautilus and how it does have a shell and it is a cephalopod but that's the exception most cephalopods do not have shells uh, their shells are going to be vestigial um, like you will see or depending on when you watch this you have seen in the squid a, a very very vestigial shell um, and that so there were many many more but during the KT extinction uh, 65 million years ago most of those uh, cephalopods with shells went extinct uh, here's a uh, movie of uh, cephalopod um, camouflage so our third class here is the gastropod um, class and uh, the gastropods are the most diverse group within the mollusks um, there are many many types of gastropods uh, there are some that are terrestrial think of the snails and the slugs within your garden um, and many are marine as you can see in the background here and in the movie many of them hang out underwater um, and so there's basically two living arrangements which you already know of you can either have a shell or you don't have a shell and so either you have the snails or the slugs um, some of these that have a shell have a structure called an operculum and an operculum is basically like a little a door like valve or like a, uh, a structure that is going to prevent anybody from getting into the shell so it closes that shell and it um, it's a little uh, they have it sort of like a hatch and uh, it prevents anything from getting into uh, the shell and getting to the body the real body of the snail and so you can see that operculum in the top left. Notice uh, there's the the snail shell, but then you see that brownish reddish uh, structure where the opening of the shell is. That is the operculum, and so it's a rather hardened structure. And so if you really wanted to eat this snail, you couldn't unless you got through either the shell or you got through the operculum. And so it's a defensive structure. Another snail is in the top right, the largest snail in the world. Uh, the African land snail is in the bottom left, um, and they do get very big, and they're actually invasive in a lot of other places in the world. Um, and then in the bottom right is a, um, 
uh, I can't remember. It's I think it's a uh, C. Uh, it's like a sea slug. Um, it's a specific kind that's commonly used in uh, aquaria, um, and it's called like the blue dragon or something like this. It's a, a very interesting, uh, actually poisonous um, or venomous type of uh, sea slug. So our uh, last class here is a polyplacophorans. Polyplacophorans are known as the chitons, and um, one of the main characteristics of our chitons is that they stick to a surface super, super, super tight, and then they have all these overlapping plates uh, on their shell. And so they are uh, aquatic, and as you can see in this background here, they have eight overlapping plates. Um, and this is largely for protection. They do have eyes uh, with lenses so they can see things. They're not just looking at, at light. Um, and they have, again, this is their main defense, is that they sort of turtle down against this surface. Uh, they use their foot to suction extremely tight against the surface. And then uh, they stick there so that the shell is flush with the surface as well. And so if you're going to try to eat a chitin, you have to really pry it off and uh, get either pry it off and then get to the soft underbelly or you have to get through the really hard shell. And so they're uh, very difficult to prey upon. And so here we have lots of different examples of chitons. Um, in the uh, top right is the largest chitin in the world. Uh, it's actually a chitin that is off of the Pacific, uh, American Pacific coast. So uh, off of Washington and Oregon uh, in California. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's called like the rubber boot chitin or rubber sole. I can't remember the name, but it's gigantic as you can see. And then in the bottom left, you can see from the underbelly, it has this really, uh, foot that's doing all the work here, sucking against the surface, preventing anybody from, um, peeling them off. So um, our next group here are the annelids, and the annelids include the earthworms, um, which we will uh, or have dissected in lab, um, the leeches, um, and uh, annelids called the beard worms. And so uh, what is an annelid? And so uh, let's talk about annelids. Number one, annelids are segmented, unlike our mollusks. And so they have up to 150 different segments within the body. And so they can get uh, fairly large and fairly complex. Um, they have bilateral symmetry because, of course, again, we are part of the bilateria group. Um, they do have a head. And so they have gone through cephalization, unlike uh, some of uh, our mollusks, like, for example, the bivalves. The digestive system is complete. They do have two openings. Uh, the coelom, they do have an entero seal, and so they have a true coelom lined with mesoderm, and they are triploblastic. They do have three germ layers. How do they get food? Uh, most uh, annelids are detritivores, so they eat uh, decaying matter or uh, matter that's uh, decomposing uh, in the uh, either the terrestrial or aquatic ecosystem. There's actually uh, many, many aquatic annelids we'll talk about. And so they also, within um, this, uh, when they eat, for example, dirt or water, uh, and they filter out everything that's in the water, they're eating a lot of other things other than just decaying matter. They're also eating protists and bacteria and other organisms that they find. And many annelids have a structure, an organ called a gizzard. And a gizzard is going to be a digestive organ um, that is going to be filled with particulate matter. Like, for example, earthworms are going to swallow small pebbles and rocks and things. And then they're going to go into the gizzard and they're going to help grind up food. Because earthworms and many other annelids don't have teeth. And so this is what is going to be used to crunch up and grind up the food before it goes on further into the digestive system. So annelids um, do have a closed circulatory system. So they do have veins and arteries, and they have blood vessels. So those are blood vessels, and they have also, oftentimes multiple hearts. And hopefully you either saw this or will see this with the earthworms. Um, they do have a brain. They have uh, two nerve cords. And again, in invertebrates, nerve cords are ventral, period, always. And so same thing with annelids. Nerve cords are going to be ventral. Your blood vessels are often dorsal 
And so in earthworms, it's a little weird because you have two blood vessels, one that's going to be dorsal, one that's going to be ventral. But usually blood vessels and invertebrates are going to be dorsal and nerve cords are going to be ventral. They do have brains, uh, but they also have either small or little ganglia in each segment. And so they help control what's going on in each segment. And so they have basically their extra brains. They do have eyes, but mostly they're for light detection. Um, and waste is removed by nephridia. Um, in, I think in the lab we call them metanephridia, uh, but it's generally the same thing. Um, just they're coiled tubes. And so notice in the um, mollusk we have the kidneys, but in here we have a little less complex structure called the nephridia. And usually gas exchange, uh, they don't really have hearts or, I mean, sorry, not hearts. They don't have gills or lungs. Instead, it's usually by diffusion through the skin. And so here's our earthworm overview. And you can see in the green on the right are the nephridia. Those occur in every single segment. Um, our two blood vessels, as I said, the dorsal and the ventral. Usually, most invertebrates just have a dorsal blood vessel, so this is a bit odd. And then they have the ventral nerve cord, which is very normal in invertebrates. So how annelids move? Um, many annelids have parapodia, which are basically like little setae uh, that are all along uh, the body. So every segment has multiple setae on it. And then they're going to basically expand their body and then contract their body over and over. And so they extract, as you can see at the bottom right, they expand certain segments and then contract them and then expand them and, and contract them. This is a process called peristalsis. And it's the same type of process that helps move the food through your digestive system. And of course, this would be impossible without segmentation because segmentation is helping um, different parts of the body do different things. And so you have one segment expand, another segment be less expanded, and if you didn't have segmentation, you couldn't move like that. When it comes to reproduction in our annelids, uh, most annelids are hermaphroditic, so they are not dioecious. Remember, dioecious means having a male and a female. And so they oftentimes they can store sperm and they can produce eggs because they have both reproductive parts. Um, they produce their eggs in an internal cocoon-like structure called the clitellum. And so you can see in the bottom right here, the expanded portion of that uh, earthworm body, which you're probably familiar with if you've ever played with earthworms as a kid, um, that is the clitellum. That is where the uh, internal cocoon, where the eggs are going to be, and then that's where fertilization occurs too. Oftentimes when it rains, earthworms will come out of the soil uh, so that they're all in the same plane and then they can uh, mate. So let's go to the classes of our earthworms. Our first class here is Arantia. Um, you can watch this little movie here. And Arantia uh, are all marine and again segmented obviously because they're in the segmented worms. I don't know why I put that there. Um, and so they are predatory. And so you, we think of these earthworms as being detritivores. Well, not Arantia. Arantia prey on other organisms, including things like fish. And so they have a very active lifestyle where they're moving around all the time. Um, unlike most annelids that uh, we commonly think of as being these uh, slow, slow moving critters through the soil, Arantia are pretty fast, pretty quick. And they can, uh, they have to be if they're going to catch fish. And so they oftentimes come out and snap and grab fish as they're swimming. Um, Sedentaria, this, these are our earthworms, and they also include other organisms that are not earthworms. And so we have the marine versions, and we also have the terrestrial versions. Most of them are fairly slow, and if they do move at all, some sedentaria don't move. They just stick in one place, and that's where they are their entire life. And so many of these are se either sediment eaters, like our earthworms, or they are filter feeders, where they'll filter the water and then any of the particulate matter that's in that water, um, they will move to the stomach and they will eat. Um, many of them are burrowers. Okay, so the, you can think of the earthworm, obviously burrows, but also a lot of the sedentaria in the ocean burrow down into the ocean sediment. And you can see in the bottom left here, um, there's that flower-like looking structure is a sedentaria annelid and it's a filter feeder that burrows down into the sediment 
And then the middle one here, the one in the yellow, is actually doesn't really usually look like that because usually it's in a tube that it makes. And that tube is deep into the sediment of the ocean. And then it lives its entire life in that tube where you see those yellow tentacles coming out. That is the only thing that's exposed. And then it filters food and it comes out and it moves in of that tube its entire life. And so many of the um, these critters have peristaltic movement and they're segmented and they can do that. Class sedentaria also includes the, um, even though we said uh, most of these guys are sediment eaters, some of them are parasitic. So our leeches are sedentary. And so uh, the leeches are of course parasitic. And you can see this uh, in the background here, this leech, terrestrial leech. And they have two powerful suckers on either side. Um, one of them can be used to stick to an organism and the other can be used to um, open up the uh, skin or the epidermis of that organism and start to suck out blood. And so they have three jaws uh, that creates a Y-shaped incision when they bite an organism. And so any organism that feeds on the liquid or the blood of another organism is called a sanguivore. And so uh, leeches are therefore parasitic sanguivores. They feed on the blood and that's where they get their nutrition. This is not like a mosquito. A mosquito is not a sanguivore because a mosquito is going to survive and live on the nectar of plants. Um, it only bites when, number one, only female mosquitoes bite and it will only bite to feed the eggs that is carrying inside of it. It itself is not going to drink and feed on the blood. So back to the leeches. Um, so they feed on the bodily fluids of a host. That is going to be a sanguivore, and that is our leech, and that is in the class sedentaria. And I think uh, that is it. Okay. <laughs>